South Carolina officials announced murder charges against a white police officer just one hour after seeing graphic video of him shooting a black suspect in the back. The man apparently was unarmed. Officer Michael Slater is being held this morning without bail. We have been asking these questions for many years, but the discourse has now grown to a deafening and alarming volume. What's happening to those who are charged with protecting citizens, but instead seem more eager to shoot and never ask relevant questions? There's plenty of meat and misconception in this argument, as another man is prepared to be buried, this time in South Carolina. Our guest is the former commissioner of the New York Police Department, who ran afoul of his own system and was sent to prison for tax fraud. His new book details his life and calls for prison reform. The book is From Jailer to Jailed, My Journey from Correction and Police Commissioner to Inmate Number 84888054. Let's welcome back Bernie Carrick to Midpoint. Bernie, it's a pleasure to talk to you again. Thank you, sir. Bernie, before we get on to the book and some other issues here, let me ask you, the video, I know you've seen it, everybody has seen it around the world millions of times of the shooting. Is there anything that you can see, anything, a sliver, if you will, that justifies the shooting taking eight shots at an unarmed man fleeing from you? Not in that video. I, I don't see anything that would, there's nothing in the video that I've seen that would justify the shooting. Um, the shooting is troubling. Um, it's disturbing. Um, by all accounts, uh, the man was running away. Uh, I don't think he had a weapon on him. Um, this stuff will all come out in court naturally. Um, but based on the video and what I saw, uh, the, the justification for deadly physical force does not, did not exist. And, uh, and the officer should not have taken those shots, taken, uh, fired his weapon. How would you answer those people, and there's a lot of them, it's a growing group right now, who say that without that video, it's very likely that the police in South Carolina would have looked to cover this up? Well, I don't know if the police would have looked to cover it up, uh, you know, and, and I can't say that this, uh, the officer wouldn't have looked to cover it up. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think this is a justification for body cameras. Um, you know, I heard some of the, uh, some of the uh, political figures in South Carolina calling on the governor to, uh, to mandate body cameras. Uh, in this case, if the officer had a body camera, um, I, I think it would have shown the realities that this, this uh, video uh, showed. Um, but, uh, you know, fortunately uh, for the family, for the victim, it was caught on tape. And... Um, you know, let the, let the process take its course uh, and justice be served. But even you have got to agree that while body cams are something everybody is calling for now, it's not a great panacea here because don't you agree that the culture has to be changed of not only cops who do these things, cops who investigate, cops who may cover up, and cops dealing with citizens? You know what? Uh, listen, cultures can be changed. I remember when I put, well, I initially put cameras in uh, the highway patrol cars in the in New York City Police Department. The union was against it. The cops were against it. Everybody was against it until the first cop was vindicated in a false allegation uh, against him, was vindicated by that camera. Um, and then the attitudes and the culture started to change. I think, listen, there's a first time for everything. And in this case, I think there's, uh, there's all, already been a national outcry for more accountability, uh, more transparency, um, f calling for the body cameras. I think this is, a, this is one of those scenarios where it's obvious and it's transparent that a body camera would have shown um, what happened. And, uh, you know, you can't, you can't refute this stuff. You can't, this is a, this is a circumstance where I, I don't care how pro-cop you are, and I'm, I'm very pro-law enforcement. I don't care how pro cop you are. Nothing justified that shooting. You know, I I I showed that I sent that video to other cops I knew, and when they first saw it, I had a, a number of them send me back a message and say, "That's not. Is that real? Is that for real?" Like they thought it was some somebody posted it online, and it was a joke. It was some kind of joke. It's not a joke. It was a real video, and unfortunately, somebody lost their life, and uh, and somebody should be be held accountable. You are very open about pointing out the mistakes that you made, the time you spent incarcerated now. We have a police officer, five years, 
who very likely is going to spend the rest of his life in jail at this point, if indeed he is convicted of murder. What is he going to face as a police officer going to jail? And what kind of alliances maybe does he need to make in order to stay alive? Well, the reality is this is, uh, this is a very different case than mine or, or anybody that was incarcerated, uh, you know, in, in the manner in which I was. If he's convicted of these charges of murder, um, there's going to be an enormous, uh, you know, sentence, uh, you know, anywhere from 20, 25 years to life. Um, I don't know the laws in South Carolina, but that was pretty much what I would imagine. Um, it's going to be a very high classification of, uh, of incarceration, uh, maximum, uh, medium uh, security. Um, and it's going to be, he's going to have a rough time ahead of him. Um, so, and because of his background, uh, he'll be placed in a population where he can be, um, he can be maintained safely. Uh, you know, the state uh, has, uh, um, you know, has a duty uh, to keep him safe, but he's going to have uh, his time cut out for him. Bernie, I only got about a minute and a half left here, so I, a couple things here, but very quickly. What, what were the faults that were exposed that made you such a prison reform advocate after spending your time in jail? I think, first of all, uh, you know, low-level, nonviolent, uh, first-time drug offenders sentenced to 10 and 15 years for nonviolent crimes. Um, you know, people that violated regulatory issues that were charged criminally, you know, commercial fishermen that caught too many fish. Um, and, and I think most importantly, the reality that a number of these people, good people that made mistakes, not bad people that did, did bad things, good people that made mistakes, they're going to live with this conviction hanging over their head for the rest of their lives. And it has an enorm enormous impact on them and their family. But most importantly, it has a negative impact on society and our economy. And I think it's something that hasn't been looked at in years, not the way it's being looked at now. And it's something that has to change because it's unsustainable economically for this country. Very briefly, Rolling Stone magazine, a publication that has the journalistic ethic of fingernail clippings. They recently said your book is a bleeding heart prison memoir and is a Matterhorn of hypocrisy. How do you answer that? Uh, you know what? I, I think uh, I'll take it as a badge of honor, uh, given who wrote that article. Um, I encourage people to read the book. You read the book, you make the decision. Indeed. With Rolling Stone's recent history, I think it's well put. The book again is From Jailer to Jailed, My Journey from Correction and Police Commissioner to Inmate Number 84888-054. A fascinating tome. Bernie Carrick, always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. All right, Bernie, take care. One of the driving forces behind America's economy. That and so much more when Midpoint continues.